Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome back to the Virtual California African American Museum. My name is Alexandra Mitchell, and as always, so delighted to see you all with us this evening and to have you back uh, for another really insightful, incredible conversation. Um, I had come with some very exciting news. The museum has reopened. I'm sure some of you in Los Angeles have seen. Um, so please do, if you feel safe enough to do so, we have taken every safety precaution available and we're having a really great experience returning. So please do come in person to see some art uh, with your families. Uh, visit our website, caamuseum.org uh, to check out how to book our free tickets online. We look forward to seeing you soon. And um, tonight we are in for a special Friday night treat. Um, the American political scene today is uh, poisonously divided and white evangelicals play a strikingly unified and powerful role in this division. These evangelicals raise an important question for electoral politics. Why do they claim morality while supporting politicians who act immorally by most Christian measures? And white evangelical racism, the politics of morality in America, Dr. Athea Butler answers the, that racism is at the core of conservative evangelical activism and power. And since the nation's founding has played a provocative role in fracturing the electorate. Dr. Athea Butler is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her other books include Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World, published also by the University of North Carolina Press, a historian in African American, Afri in, I'm sorry, African American and American religion. Professor Butler's research and writing spans African American religion, history, race, politics, and evangelism. She writes opinion pieces covering religion, race, politics, and popular culture for the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and NBC. You can see her on the recent PBS series, The Black Church in America, and a forthcoming American experience on Billy Graham set to air in May 2021 20, on PBS. We are also joined by the incomparable Dr. Melissa Harris Perry, the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair and Professor in the Department of Politics and International Affairs and the Department of Women, Gender Studies and Sexuality Studies at Wake Forest University. She's the founder and president of the Anna Julia Cooper Center and a longstanding columnist and contributor to The Nation. She is also the co-host of the Nation System Check podcast. From 2012 to 2016, she hosted the much-loved Melissa Harris Perry show on weekend mornings on MSNBC and was awarded the Hillman Prize for broadcast journalism. She's penned regular columns for Essence and the Nation and served as editor-in-large for L.com, Zora, a medium publication for women of color. We invite you to use the question and answer feature tonight to engage both Dr. Butler and Dr. Melissa Harris Perry. And with that, I turn the conversation over to Dr. Harris Perry. Welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to um, to be here, uh, not really in California, but virtually in California. Uh, I'm sitting outside here in North Carolina where it's quite a bit later. So um, I apologize for my dark sky. And Thea, Butler. It is so, I mean, I'm trying not to smile so much because it's kind of a difficult time and a difficult topic, but I am so happy to see you. I am too, Melissa. It's been, it's been a long time and it's been too long. And, you know, this pandemic just makes everything worse because we would have invariably seen each other someplace, right? But we've all been locked up in the house. And, but this is one good thing about being locked up in the house is that we can see each other virtually. So there you go. That's right. So let's talk about that for a second. We're going to get onto the book and we have lots to cover, but um, this has been, <laughs> I mean, I sort of want to say this has been a really hard five years, but let me, let me zero in on this week. Um, even if you don't, I have been watching the trial, but even if you don't watch it, it is there. Um, and then obviously today more um, violence at, uh, at the Capitol. So let me just ask, how are you doing, my friend? It's tough. Um, it was really hard to know that it wasn't eight minutes and some odd seconds. It was actually nine minutes, right? You know, and I keep thinking, how long are we going to keep going through all this and, and what happened tonight and, you know, the shootings that have happened in the last couple of weeks? It's, it's really tough to live in America right now because we're in a space where I think people are really losing it, but they're losing it because of the ways in which the past influences the present, right? And so I don't know. I mean, I keep wanting to have hope, 
but it's, you know, for, for Christians, it's Holy Week. And I just keep thinking, why do Black people keep getting crucified all the time? I mean, I'm so glad you that's literally where I was going is yeah. we also hear, I don't think when we first um, decided to, to talk tonight, I wasn't, I don't think I was quite aware that it was Good Friday. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I feel as though we've been at the foot of the cross. And, I, you know, obviously, um, no one is making a claim about um, uh, the divinity of Mr. Floyd, of George Floyd. Um, but I, I do, I feel like sometimes when we think and talk about the cross um, and the experience even of the stations of the cross that so many Christian churches are uh, engaging with in these uh, Thursday and Friday nights, um, that maybe we don't really let it enter us, what it would have been like to have watched the horror that is a crucifixion. And yet this week, I can't not think of it exactly in those terms. No, exactly. I mean, we watch this horror over and over and over again, whether it's Mike Brown or, you know, George Floyd uh, or any of the other myriad of people, you know, lynching, you know, this is what our grandfathers and our grandmothers watched and our great great parents watched and our great great greats watched, right? They have just seen this litany of black bodies being crushed. And so, you know, for black people, Easter is a really important time, but I think we rush too quick to go to Easter because we've had so much travail and and punishment and horribleness happen to us that it's really difficult sometimes to think about why, why do we even bother with this religion in the first place, right? Why even bother with Christianity? And I think, you know, for me, that's been a big question as we keep hearing people say, you know, well, he just should have obeyed the police. But I'm like, but the policeman was crazy. He was a murderous thug. And this is what you call us all the time, but you have murderous people on your side. And so I think, you know, we, we sit there tonight, you know, and, and on Good Friday, trying to think about how you get to a Sunday. But the question is, is are we ever gonna get to Easter Sunday in this country? A real Easter Sunday. So let's, let's begin with the book yeah. and right there. So you are in this book giving us history. I wanna, I wanna be clear, it is, it's a book of religious studies. It's a book of religious history. It is, you're not doing a constructive theology. You're not, um, although I really did, just for you brought out my whole King James version. <laughs> the are you is that a Bible? Yeah, it was easy. <laughs> I brought a whole Bible. Um, and, and for folks who don't know, I was raised Unitarian Universalist. So like having a King James Bible and, and bringing it uh, means I was taking very seriously the way that you were um, uh, engaging uh, with us. And, and, but, but I do want to point out to folks who maybe haven't had a chance to read the book yet, that, it's, that it is a history. So just start there with me. And then we're gonna, we are actually gonna break into some of the, the biblical work that you do and some of the theological work. But I want to start with the historical. What is value of studying the history of evangelicalism? Yeah, this is this is a good question. Thank you. I think the value of studying the history of evangelicalism is this. If you read all the rest of the histories that came before this one, you would think that evangelicals were really great people. They did abort, you know, they fought for abolitionism. They did missionary work. They, they did education. They did all of these things. But this history is different. This history is about the racism that has accompanied the movement. It's about the history of slavery, how evangelicals held slaves, how they used the Bible to support that, how they, when they lost the Civil War in the South, how they kept this going by thinking about the lost cause and how they would sanctify white womanhood and denigrate black womanhood and black people. It is a history of how in the civil rights movement, the word communism was used to you know, thrash anybody who was trying to work for black people to come out of Jim Crow. And this is the kind of history that you need to see, or that history, if we want to think about, that's really close to the present, the history that we think that evangelicals were really um, uh, upset about abortion, when the thing that they were upset about was having to pay taxes, because Bob Jones University, you know, basically said, we don't want to have Black people there, we don't want to integrate, right? How they have, you know, controlled the educational system, how they have controlled voting, this is very important this week as we see all the voting rights being you know, swept away, how they've talked about Muslims, how they talked about the first black president, 
I mean, I can go on and this history, this 200 plus year history shows a different kind of way about evangelicals than they have wanted to think about themselves. And I think it's really important. The second reason why this history is important is for black evangelicals. And these are the people I really wanna to talk to because if you are sitting in an evangelical church right now, you are African-American or any other ethnicity, you have to realize what you are sitting under is a system in which this puts you at the bottom of the pile. You are not at the top. This is not about colorblind Christianity because the only color that is being seen is white. And so I think this is really important, not just for white evangelicals to read, but for evangelicals of color to read because they need to understand what is operational in their churches that has been upsetting them, but they don't know how to put a name or a face on it. Now, to be um, provocative maybe on that, I'd say, yeah, but but we take part in the American project. I'm sitting here, I, I'm a Southerner and hope to never be but a Southerner for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, you live in Philadelphia and more than a few bad things happen there. And, and so maybe there is a story. So, so I, I want to, um, I, I want to push on this to ask, um, as Black folk in America, we, we are participating, even when we're pushing back, we're still participating in a system mm -hmm. that has systematically put us on the bottom. So for those people who say, yeah, but History is in the past. Let it go. Like, okay, yes, you can show me that there were bad things, but I can show you there were bad things about your your people or the systems you participate in. And you know, I'm speaking to you right now on an Apple computer, and mm -hmm. Lord knows the the you know the the practices related to that. Why not just let it go? Why do we need to engage these difficult histories? Because it still affects your life today. That is the answer. And, you know, you can't just let it go. I mean, people wanted to let slavery go and just keep moving, but, you know, it continues to haunt us. The ways in which things get constructed for us are still haunting us. So when you look at, you know, let's use Governor Kemp here for a minute of Georgia, who signs a, a voting bill into law. What was the picture behind him? It was a plantation. And what happened on the outside of the door? A black female legislator is knocking on the door and she gets drug away and arrested because six white men are gonna be afraid of one black woman knocking at a door. So these things are still affecting us. There's, there's no way that they're not affecting us. In all of these things that evangelicals talk about, the construction of the family, how they want people to vote, how they want people to behave, how they think about education, you know, their love of Donald Trump, all of these things have a historical background to them. And I think if you, if you poo-poo away history, you basically don't understand where we are right now and why this is so important. It's, it's the question between, for those of you who know, the 1619 Project and the 1776 Project, basically. Right, and, and if, for those of you who don't know, right, it's a question of whether or not we begin telling the American story in 1619 when the first enslaved Africans arrive here, but before America is in fact America, right, while it is still in its colonial stage, or whether we begin that story with the 1776 moment of um, the, the, the writing of the Declaration of Independence, right, and it, it changes sort of where you foundationally imagine, right, the American project begins. And of course, it's Nicole Hannah-Jones and her brilliance that brought 1619. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And a place that we need to think about. So I, you know, I think about this book as a way to sort of situate evangelicalism in a very different way and in the history that it should be situated in, where it's connected to lots of things that are happening on the outside. And also for you to see why evangelicals have gained so much power. Why have they become such a big voting block? Why do they continue to, you know, fight for things that seem antithetical to the gospel? All right. So I also just want to point out, you, you were talking about uh, Governor Kemp in Georgia and that monster um, voting suppression bill that he just signed, just to make another Good Friday tie-in. One of the uh, provisions of that bill makes it illegal, right? Illegal to bring water to people standing in line to vote. And again, if we think about the story of Good Friday um, and the, the notion that it is the most basic, right? Um, act of the Christian, right, or um, to in fact give water to those who are in a position of suffering. So it is, it is, it is a reminder of exactly that rub. So let me ask you this, as a good American, if yeah. I'm starting in 1776 and, and maybe 1789 and, and, and freedom of speech and thought and the things that make America great, mm -hmm. don't people have a right to be racist? I mean, what? <laughs> Like, so, you know, so, 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 okay, so the evangelicals are racist. Mm -hmm. 
Why should I care? Yeah, what's at stake? Why should we care? Well, what's at stake is basically, you know, our democracy right now, because they don't want to have democracy. And I can talk about that in more detail. But I think what's at stake is we need to care whether they're racist or not, because they control a lot of the policies that are being written. Um, I just saw before I came on today, there's a big chart from a minister called Ministry Watch, where they talk about how much money that evangelicals are putting into different kinds of things with some of the organizations that they have. For religious freedom, they're giving over 100 million. Okay, that's, that's a huge number of money to fight for religious freedom, which is kind of a bugaboo for some other things. But for poverty, it's like maybe like 5 million or something like that. I need to get the exact figures, but it's a very small number on this chart. And if you follow me on Twitter, you can see the chart because I, I, I retweeted it earlier. But it's, it's a way in which we need to start looking at this because it's not just about you know, the things that they say they want morally, it's about how much money is going into this. What, what is the power? Who, what kind of candidates are they, you know, voting in there? You know, it, people like Matt Getz, they vote for, right? Doesn't matter if he's doing all the things that he's doing and paying women on cash app. That doesn't matter anymore. It used to matter for evangelicals, but it doesn't matter anymore. So I think we need to really start thinking about what this means and why it controls us and why we need to begin to confront this in a very different kind of way. And I hope the book does that. So you and I both have somewhat complicated um, childhood experiences of religion. Yeah. Um, I like to think of you as my Catholic evangelical, uh, you know, seminary trained religious scholar. Um, so for those who don't know your story, can you tell a little bit about your own um, sort of faith trajectory, not so much the academic part, but maybe how the academic part then engaged with that faith trajectory? Yeah, well, actually, this is very funny because um, if my mother were watching, she'd be laughing because today is actually the anniversary of my first lecture. I was six years old. It was in her in her classroom, and um, it was I was in Catholic school then, and she was teaching public school. I got to tell the stories; it's very funny. And she came back into the room, and she heard me say, "And they laid him in the sepulcher." And she's like, "I didn't know you knew that word." And 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 everybody said, "Well, Miss Butler, shut up! She's telling us the story about Jesus." So even as a kid, I was very precocious. But basically, uh, raised in Texas Catholic. Uh, moved to California, didn't like Catholic churches, went to with a friend to evangelical church, uh, loved it, you know, became evangelical and went to seminary where I started, you know, really realizing things. And I have to say that I went to seminary at a really crucial time in Los Angeles. It was the 1992 uprising or riots, depending on where you are. I like to call it uprising. And I lived there then. And one of the stories I tell in the book is about this thing called Love LA that um, was happening when they wanted to bring all the churches together. Some of you all will know out in the audience, Bishop Kenny Ulmer. Uh, it was him, it was Jack Hayford, it was Hollywood Prez. And there's, a, there's an event that happened that really made me have to think about what's going on with these people and how did they treat me? And I won't give it away, but that was probably part of my beginning of coming back to the Catholic church. Now, I wanna say upfront that I have problems with everything because I'm a religious study scholar and, and I critique them all. I, I wanna fight with everybody, but there's, there's a sense in which for me personally, the Catholic church made sense because I didn't have to give up my intellectual life. And that was really important for me personally, but evangelicals have always you know, captured me in part because I was trained that way, first of all. And then secondarily, these, these questions between what they say about themselves and what they do were always disjunctive. And that's where this book is coming out of. So, I want you to I want you to just stay in that tension for a second mm -hmm. because um, I think the attraction to evangelicalism is important to knowledge. Like, you know, in part to read the text, like, why would anybody be evangelical, right? One could certainly read a history of the Catholic Church and also think, mm -hmm. why would anybody continue to hang out with the Catholics, right? Given yeah. the history of the Catholic Church. Um, I, Although I did not grow up myself a uh, Latter-day Saints, I come from a Latter-day Saints family, um, mm -hmm. which is part of why, like, you were already on ham in, like, uh, like the first, like, 17, you know, 18 pages. I was like, oh, we're going straight to the sins of ham here. Yeah. I, 
I want I want to talk about what it means for we'll go to the politics, but I want to talk about what it means for believers mm-hmm. who are attracted to the to the style, to the culture, to the maybe they have childhood experiences of love, of having been reared in a church that 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 surrounded them and their community and and you arrive and you're like, yeah, so by the way, Billy Graham, who y'all love a lot, mm-hmm. let me go ahead and do a slight read on that brother. How, how can we hear it? Not so much we, but how can folks mm-hmm. hear what you're doing? Yeah, I think the way you need to hear it is, is that I try to keep a tone, and this was very difficult in the book, to keep a tone that says, this is, these are the facts. This is what you need to contend with. And this is a story and it's a hard story. It's not an easy story. Somebody said, why did you just hit us with a baseball back on the first page? And I'm like, well, you know, because that's kind of how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm busting through the wall like the Kool-Aid man. I really don't have any other way to do it, right? But I think the way I want people to, to, to read the story and to sort of think about it is to think about the ways that it affects them, whether they're evangelical or not. Because I think, you know, one of the people who um, gave me a blurb said something very astute. She said, we all are complicit in the ways that evangelicals have, you know, shaped American culture. So this heavy idea about individualism, how, you know, we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, what that personal relationship is. And, you know, Jesus talks to me and, I, you know, I'm gonna hurt some people in the audience right now. You know, Jesus is my main man. He's my boyfriend. When I don't have a man, he is the man for me, right? That it comes out of an evangelical world. That's not something that, you know, makes any sense to anybody else, but it's very much about a personal relationship. But the problem is with the personal relationship and the individualism that it doesn't make you see the corporate sins. It doesn't make you see structural sin. It doesn't make you see structural racism. And it doesn't make you see the ways in which this disenfranchises people because you privilege white patriarchy that's religious over and against everyone else. And I think that's the thing I want to say. So, you know, at the end of the book, I make a very strong appeal to evangelicals to say, you are complicit in a lot of things that have happened that have not been good in this country. And you believe that you're doing the right thing, but I'm here to tell you, you're not. And that's a hard thing to hear. Is it possible that God doesn't love Black people? Well, you know, that was probably one of the first reasons why I got in trouble online because I talked about, uh, you know, a philosopher who back in 1970 wrote a book called Is God a Right Racist? I mean, you know, for a lot of people, this is possible. I mean, there was a big, you know, theological discussion going on online over the weekend about Lil Nas X. And, you know, a lot of people said, this is the last days. A lot of Black people said this, the last days that he's going down to hell on a stripper pole. And somebody said, he said back to them, which I thought was very astute theologically. He said, how is this the last days when we have slavery in the Holocaust? And I was like, how can you argue with that? This is, this is exactly it. But I think it's about what kind of God you think there is. And I think this is a question about evangelicals. It's like, what kind of God is this that takes care of you and doesn't want to take care of everybody else and makes you mean and makes you not want to give to the poor and makes you not want to do all these other things? What God are you actually worshiping? So, so I want to stick here for a minute because I want to stick on some of these beliefs, uh, in part because you you begin so early in the book with Ephesians mm-hmm. um, and the discourse around uh, slaves obey your masters. Yeah. And, and, and these um, verses of Ephesians have been um, for years presented as, um, a, as the basis for American chattel slavery. Mm-hmm. So let me ask, obviously the Bible comes first, right? Like in, in history, in time before chattel enslavement. Mm-hmm. But slavery in the ancient world. It, what would it have occurred without it, right? Like, um, even if you got the, the, the scripture right, even if you got the theology right, mm-hmm. would right racism still exist in these systems um, that would, even without Ephesians, right? So take Ephesians out of the Bible altogether. You think you, the economic and political and interpersonal and social value of slavery for whiteness was it enough or did it need God, right? Did it need a kind of biblical reference point in order to allow it to exist for so long? You know, 
it, it needs God, but you know, to be honest with you, there's another way I could have written this book. I could have gone back even further. I could have gone back to Calvin and talked about predestination. And for those of you who don't understand predestination, that means some of us are gonna go to heaven and some of us are damned. And if you believe in double predestination, it means that some of you are gonna to go to heaven and definitely some of y'all are gonna to go to hell. And basically it would be black people going to hell, right? And so, you know, when we start to think about the Dutch and slavery or, you know, all of these different kinds of groups and even what the Catholic church did about slavery, they pretended like, oh no, slavery is bad, but, you know, look at the Georgetown slavery project where they sold off slaves to let Georgetown, you know, remain a, a school and a university. I think it's really important to understand that the Bible is just one linchpin about this. There are other things that happen that bring about slavery. And in the American context, it's very easy for people who are not carrying around Bibles in the 19th century, like, like you and I are, maybe. It's important to think about the ways in which people hear these stories and how they interpret them. So <coughs> well, I, I love some of the work that you're doing here. I want to just keep doing this for a little bit more than I promise we'll get back into some of the um, sort of electoral politics. But um, it was so important to me that you were framing the aspects of evangelicalism that are um, that are contributing to this to, to the racism, sort of in multiple ways, right? So some of it is about um, chapter and verse, right? It's about scriptural reference points and a way of kind of cherry picking those scriptural reference points mm -hmm. to talk about domination. Part of it is, as you just said. Um, this issue of the kind of interpersonal individual relationship, just me and God, right, mm -hmm. and, and our, my own personal confession, and it's not about, right, a uh, collective or community relationship, um, the, the structural relationship. Yeah. Talk to me about faith in general, and, and so here's part of what I mean by this. When I look at the fact-free public environment that we live in, mm -hmm. where um, so much of the discourse about everything from coronavirus to um, to election outcomes is presented inherently as a faith claim, right? Like, nope, that's what it is because I said it is, and that's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And that is, I mean, you you kind of can't, you don't really do evidence in Christianity. Like, I mean, we believe a lot. We do evidence in Christianity. Most people just don't. You know, this is this is the whole thing is that they don't. And it, it's all about, I feel, I feel, I feel, right? I feel like this is gonna happen. Can can I use an example of somebody I don't really bring up in the book, but I think is really good? Let's let's use Paula White. You know, remember she had that video and I'm gonna strike and strike and strike and I need the angels from, you know, Africa to come. I'm like, why you gotta get African angels? They don't have no European angels to come help the white president. I mean, why are you gonna get black angels and they not coming? You know, so it, it's this interesting moment in which you can, you can pray for things and they don't happen, but it's like what, what has happened with Q, right? If you don't have one thing happen, you can make this other thing happen, right? And you can just continue to move on with all of these sort of prophecies and things that you think about. And I think one of the hard things about, you know, evangelicals, especially in the American context, is they don't have answers for when God doesn't answer them, or they think that, you know, that God should answer them, or they think that God should favor them one more than the other. And I think part of the book, maybe the underlying thing in this book is that I'm saying that these people have felt like God has favored them because they have been able to get a lot of things. And maybe this is not about favor. Maybe this is about power. And, and that's a lot different than saying you have God's favor. What you have is, you know, temporal power. And that temporal power is the thing that makes you who you are. And, and that power comes out of, you know, making somebody else have to be subjected to you or to make somebody feel less than you. And, and what does that mean in terms of what you think about your, what, what the you know, story of Christianity is supposed to be about anyway? What is it that is white in white evangelicalism? Is it the people or is there a thing that is called white or that, that you think of as white evangelicalism and any person could have it, including black or brown people? Yeah, well, I think part of it is cultural. What one of the things I do at the beginning of the book is to try to, you know, set down the terms of what I'm talking about and defining. So you have to really think about, um, you know, there's an evangelicalism that says it's about, you know, putting out the gospel, the Greek word evangelion, you know, spread the gospel, right? But then there's this other thing about evangelical. And there's a quote in the book where I use from George Marsden. He says, evangelical is anybody who likes Billy Graham. 
But what has happened, and which I think is very important, is there's been a political use of evangelicalism since the 1970s onward that has made this very much associated with white people. And so when we said white evangelical racism at the beginning of the book, it's not to say that there's not evangelicals out here that are non-white. It is to say, we are speaking about a particular group within evangelicalism, and we want you to know that these are white people we're talking about and how they relate to everybody else and how they relate to power and politics. And so that was the reason why I did it. And I know for some people, somebody said on Twitter the other day, they said, don't you think this is a little redundant to put white and evangelical together? Because they already thought evangelical meant white, right? But I mean, think about something like the Pew Foundation. The Pew Foundation, when they measure evangelicals, they are not measuring Black people. And there's tons of Black people who think the same way as evangelicals do. But they're not measuring Black churches, they're me measuring white evangelicals. And so I think it's really important to sort of set the ground rules about who I'm looking at what I'm doing and how that is structured throughout the book. And that may, you know, annoy some people, but I think it's really important to show the contrast at times, especially when I talk about Black evangelicals like Bill Pinnell or, you know, Tom Skinner. So you just talked about the ways that either officially or um, in our discourse, words like evangelical are just presumed to be white. Yeah. Talk to me about the word Christian and the word American, do we also presume that that need, like, are there any real Christians who aren't white from this sort of worldview? Are there any real Americans who aren't white from this worldview? Absolutely. I mean, but you know, the, pro the, the again, the issue with that is, is that they have picked up these kinds of notions and beliefs. So, you know, it, and we saw this in the election, there were, you know, I, I remember looking in the post, they had a different slew of people who were talking about who they're going to vote for beforehand. There was an older African American gentleman who was from New Orleans, he was Catholic, and he said he was going to vote for Trump. The reason why he was going to vote for Trump was because of abortion. And this is that moment where I say, okay, this is the, you know, this is the overlap between groups and how people think about themselves because he was voting on a moral issue, right? And so for so many people who vote, who have, they're one issue voters. They're thinking about how are they gonna, you know, this is the thing that I'm voting about. Is this person gonna be good on this? Yes, then, I'll, then I will vote for them. And I think that's what's sort of defining some of this. And the slippage comes where we can't look at, you know, I would say like a denomination like Church of God in Christ, like I wrote about before, that feels like very evangelical to me because they have certain kinds of things that they believe in, you know, no, no, no sex before marriage, you know, no to homosexuality, no to same sex marriage, you know, right? But they, they are democratic voters. And just because they're democratic voters, they don't get counted because, you know, we associate evangelical with Republican. So let's talk about that, because there was a time when part of what um, defined those people who, you know, um, who like Billy Graham and, and, and thought of themselves and self-identified as evangelical was also that they were, um, they were largely absent from the political space. So if I was studying this, not from a religious studies standpoint, but from a political science standpoint, as you know, as I do, then I, what I would see is like, okay, there's sort of this period where because the focus is so much, and again, Billy Graham is such a good example of this, right? The afterlife, right? The, the thing we're making perfect is the kingdom of God in some late and making ourselves morally perfect in order to, uh, you know, get there in the afterlife. And therefore, Right, you should do the most basic things you have to do on earth, but voting and elections and particularly partisan politics where you take a side was, was considered like really anti-evangelical, right? You yeah. fine to be a voter, but you don't really get down in the muck. Mm -hmm. So can you be mad that the Republicans figured out, hey, there's a whole group of voters over there who are latent, who don't they they're they're like the white racist version of Stacey Abrams. Like they were like, oh, look at all these people who nobody's knocking on their doors. Mm -hmm. Let's go get them. Let's turn them out and let's build a power base. Yeah, and, I know you can, and by yeah. the way, I acknowledge that it's crazy town to say someone can be the white racist version of Stacey Abrams. I'm just yeah, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, and that's what they did in the 70s. I mean, the crazy thing is, it's, you know, it's it's Paul Weirich. It's, you know, it's a white Catholic guy who's like, let's let's get everybody together. You know, we don't want everybody to vote. And so they figure this out mm -hmm. and it becomes really important for them. 
right? And so, no, we can't be, I mean, I don't think we should be mad at them. I think what happened is, and, and I've said this a lot, and this is, you know, again, this might be one of those things that really hurt people. One of the things I said was that I think, you know, what Black churches have to think about is not just about voting this time. It's about, you know, capturing what, what Republicans did in the 70s and 80s and 90s, which was get the school board, get the local government, get the state government, you know, all the way up, we have focused in on the top, but we haven't focused in on those local things. And this is why what's happening in Georgia right now is very important because there's not enough people to push that over in the legislature to make it not happen. And, and that's the thing, of course it's gerrymandering and all the rest of this stuff, right? But, but at the crucial moment, they were plotting and planning. It was like, you know, I always joke about Voltron, but everybody came together. Right, and they did it, and and evangelicals helped them do it, and that's the you know that's the important part of the book that I want people to see is like they're complicit in this thing, you know they from the late seventies forward, you know they're very naive about Ronald Reagan, but once Ronald Reagan is over with, they 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 pull themselves together and they figure it out. Well, the election and then presidency um, and and the near the 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 closer than it should have been um, uh, reelection attempt of um, of President Trump is a reminder of what a good sales tactic white racism uh, and white supremacy can be and how useful it can be for engaging um, new voters and for folks who were um, disaffected. And so I guess part of what I'd be interested in in thinking about in this kind of Corona moment when so many churches have been unable to meet in person when many mainline churches were already um, seeing declines, even when they could have in person. Yeah. Is it, um, might it end up being a strategy for building congregations for even mainline churches, um, mainline Protestant churches to sort of lean into white supremacy a little bit to bring folks back to their pews? Yeah, and, and I, I like what you said about lean into it. I'd like to lean into it to push it away. And, and that's part of the issue is like, how do you push back against this? How do you push back for this? And even if you're at home and you can't be at church, what can you do? And I think this becomes a really important moment to start speaking to congregations in a very different way than you know, perhaps has happened previously, where you start to see yourself as, it's not just about these, these things about morality, you know, because what's happened with evangelicals is that they've used morality very cleverly. They've said, oh, we care about, you know, sexuality, we care about abortion, and we care about these things. But the reality was behind the scenes, they were pushing other stuff. And they were making sure that, you know, black and brown people and, and Asians didn't get anything. And this is, this is where, you know, black churches really have to, you know, like, take this to extra level. And I know it's a lot to ask right now especially because of, you know, whether we got George Floyd or you're thinking about, you know, people who need to get shots or, you know, unemployment, <clears throat> education, all of these things. But we're really at this interesting moment, which it could go either way. And it, it, it really is crucial. And I think it's a moment where we need to understand that coming together and in a way that focuses in on here are the things that are problematic. Mm -hmm. And that will help to change it. So let me just use an example. There's lots of churches that have, been, that have cared about immigration, right? And what's happening on the border. Mm -hmm. Nobody has been paying attention to the plain loads of Haitians who have been taken back, you know, like regular, like clockwork. I've been watching this and this is something, you know, on the one hand, the administration is saying, this is what we're gonna do on the Texas, you know, a border. This is what we need to do. But nobody's doing that for Haitians. Nobody's doing that for Black, you know, African refugees who've been in this country trying to stay and they are being set back, you know, by the plane load. But this is this is an issue. And I think these are the things that we need to start picking up on. So I, I love what you just did there because you did an intersectional analysis for us, right? So um, the anti-Blackness and the immigration issue, right, at that intersection. So I want you to get a little intersectional with me as well on white evangelical racism and its connection to patriarchy and sexism. And, and I wanna just really ground it in the racist, sexist murders of Asian women working, earning a living outside of Atlanta, um, murdered by a white man who self-identifies as evangelical and identifies his motive as connected to a kind of angst about 
sexuality, which is rooted in a particular intersectional way that we think and talk about mm -hmm. Asian women, man, it was like, I, I guess, I, um, yes, can you think through that with us a little bit? Yeah, no, it, it was horrible. And there's some very interesting intersections about what happened with that case. And, and, and you know, I just cannot say how sorry I am that, that this has happened because on the one hand, it, it's, it's terrible. Any murder is terrible, but you could already hear what the defense was going to be when the sheriff opened up his mouth and said, you know, oh, he, he had a sexual addiction. This is the classic evangelical line. I have a sex addiction. Please forgive me. No, you are a murderous person. You didn't have to go kill anybody because of this, but because his parents put him out of the house the night before, they already had a track on his car, so probably what's going to come out in the court case is that he spent all their money at the massage parlors. He thought that in order to get rid of his sin, he needed to get rid of these women. Mm -hmm. And that's this is this is just fundamentally down in a, in a kind of evangelical way of looking at, you know, this sin is hurting me, so I need to go do something about it rather than I need to, you know, try to get away from this and make restitution about it. No, 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 no. He's going to just wipe everybody out. That's the first thing. Second, Southern Baptist. <clears throat> Clearly God and guns, okay? And we, we cannot not talk about that because that was an important part of this church. And that has come out in some of the material before they took their website down that they talked about a lot. That's second. Third, he had already been in a kind of a, you know, rehab center for sexual, I, I, I don't want to even say sexual demons, but just sex, sex problems, right? That place was, came out of focus on the family. It was an offshoot from that. Now, why do we care about this? The reason why we care about it is because focus on a family who's James Dobson, big evangelical. In the 80s, he was part of this government board that looked at pornography and said how awful it was. And so one of the big ministries in, in evangelicalism is preaching against pornography, okay? So as one of my friends said very well, it's like, why would you, if you just wanted to go kill some sex workers, there's a whole bunch of, you know, strip clubs in Atlanta, but he went where he went. And so you know that that's not just only about sex, but it's a hate crime. He went to a specific place where he could find specific kinds of women. And so this idea that, you know, any woman that makes you feel sexual is dirty and wrong. All of these things come out of scripture in a way about teaching about sexuality that is, you know, that hurts people. And it, and it makes people, so whether it's about, you know, you know, heterosexual desire, um, homosexual desire, anything that is supposed to be not of God, because, you know, you're looking at scriptures like Romans or whatever, then there's a penalty and you get kicked out. And this is how people get messed up. And this young, this young man who went to do this thing destroyed, you know, the lives of eight families and, and the people that he killed because he couldn't, he was not in a place that could deal with, you know, his sexuality. And I think this is, this is where these churches go wrong because they, you know, they make everybody feel dirty. They make everybody feel cheap. And then in, in the process, it hurts women and it hurts people who are trying to do sex work who you know are there for different sorts of reasons, and it's nothing wrong with this, and that's that's what they do, and and anybody can do what they want to do, but to have to think that some Bible thumping dude is gonna come with a gun and kill you because you give him massages, I mean it's embarrassing, and it's it's disgusting. It also feels selective of the scripture, so mm -hmm. um, part of what I love about what you just said there is the way that that scripture is used hurts people. And that made me think of, of, of the feminist theologian, um, I think theologian, maybe biblical scholar, but Phyllis Tribble, who, yes. who wrote the foundational text, right? Texts of terror. The mm -hmm. idea that, that this, right, this document can either be a text of love and, and liberation or can be a text of terror mm -hmm. and has often been used as a text of terror, particularly against women. So I can remember when I first read that book or first even encountered those ideas and was like, oh, so there's more than one way to read, for example, Ephesians or more than one way to read um, and to emphasize any of these moments, right? That, <laughs> that to think that sort of the message of the gospel is against sex workers as opposed to embracing of sex workers depends on how you read that, right? Yeah. Do a little bit of that work for me, acknowledging you're not a biblical scholar, but 
talk to me a little bit about how some of these foundational texts for the racism of white evangelicals might be either reread, re rehistoricized, right? Mm -hmm. I do feel like part of what happens in these conversations around faith is people say, yeah, but but I believe this to be true. And here's <laughs> what it said. Right? Yes, like, exactly. like, like I but like we if we start with I believe this is true and it says this, mm -hmm. then what mm -hmm. can you do? Yeah, so let's let's hurt the people in the audience right now because I know they listen in, so I'm gonna hurt them. You know, Romans, you know, that whole thing, you've got to read that in the context of what is going on at that particular time period about about homosexuality that's not all of the scripture did jesus say anything about this no not one what did jesus do with the adulterous woman go and sin no more right so this is this is all the issue right i mean the other one that really gets on my nerves especially that is used against women is proverbs 31 let me just stop there for a minute and say proverbs 31 Mm -hmm. because everybody's like, this is what this woman is supposed to be, all this. I would like to remind everybody that Rahab is in the line of Jesus and she's a, she's a prostitute. So she's part of his genealogical line. So when we start to look at these different scriptures about how they get used, if you're not, you know, if you're not sitting up there saying, well, you know, I, I don't want to read Greek. I don't want to learn Hebrew to get behind what's, what's being said to me in the pulpit because I just used my King James Bible and nothing else, then you're not really reaching what you need to in terms of scripture. I think that if you have to, you know, if you consider that slavery was based on, you know, the curse of Ham or the curse of Cain or Onesimus going back to his master, excuse me, or Ephesians, mm -hmm. and we fought a whole civil war so we, you know, so that, you know, there would not be slavery in this country. And you have to realize that sometimes scripture does not apply to where we are in the present day. And I think that is the hardest thing for people to understand and see that this is a, this is a book that came together over time. It is not presented to you one 66 books, you know, right at the beginning. It takes a long time to make the canon. It's, it's you know, a couple hundred years before they decide some things didn't make it, other things did. So people just sort of accept that their Bible is what it is when that scripture was never put together that way in the first place. And that's, that's really important for folks to understand. And listen, I love that you went to Proverbs 31. I felt like, like since it's good for I'm gonna jump up, say amen when you got the text, right? So since I am looking at the King, King James, I'm reminded like the number of weddings that I've attended, not so much in Zoom land, but the number of weddings that I've attended where um, from 10 on is read around the virtuous wife, but mm -hmm. so rarely is, um, is Proverbs 31, eight and nine read, right? Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and the needy, right? Like so much gets left out around mm -hmm. the fundamental question of justice. And so I want, to, I want to ask that final question then we'll start actually drawing in these really great questions I'm seeing in the Q&A. Um, but I want to ask about justice mm -hmm. and whether or not an alternate way to engage folks who say, this document is true, I believe it to be true, and, I, and, and so anything you're gonna tell me, we're gonna to have to find in here, because my goodness, isn't there a story to be told here about justice? Absolutely, they did justice all the time. I mean, and I, I won't even go to Old Testament justice because that means you're gonna to have to kill somebody. Well, but <laughs> let's take New Testament justice. What did Jesus come to do? Luke chapter four, to heal the brokenhearted, bind their wounds, proclaim victory, you know, freedom to the captives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What about the book of Acts where they have all things in common? Guess what? They would have called Peter a socialist now because, you know, we have all things in common. How do they think people were living back then? Who took care of the widows? I mean, this is the kind of thing that I just, you know, you can look at scripture and see these moments where there are things that are being called called for that are about justice, about not lying, about truth telling, about all the things that you are supposed to do and what happens to you if you are unjust. And so I think that the ways in which people, you know, again, looking at what evangelicals would like to you to do, if you read the scripture as just part of what is supposed to happen to you individually and not what we're supposed to be doing corporately, then you are not reading it fully in the way that it should be read. So let's stick right here. 
Kimberly Hampton. Um, so let me first, let me pause and invite folks who are engaging with us um, to feel free to drop additional questions um, into the chat, uh, excuse me, into the Q&A bubble. I am, um, I am taking a look at them and reading them and, and, um, and, and want to sort of um, uh, amplify and forefront them now. Um, so at one point there you were uh, talking about um, what is happening in Georgia and the voter suppression efforts um, and the ways in which that is connected to, to both a, a kind of religious narrative and obviously a Confederate narrative. Yeah. And so I love this question from Kimberly Hampton about a different version of white Georgia evangelical, President Jimmy Carter, and the ways in which he has been largely written out of or pushed away from um, the story. So talk to me about where Jim, you know, where does he fit in the Billy Graham uh, version of what an evangelical is? You know, I, I, you know, I have to say, Jimmy Graham, I mean, I, I just got to confuse. Jimmy Carter doesn't fit because basically Jimmy Carter had to leave his de denomination. He started off as a Southern Baptist, but they were so crazy when they split in the you know late eighties, early nineties. He left them because he thought about women being you know being able to preach all of these different things. He left, but you know the thing back in the seventies. Evangelicals really didn't like him then because he really thought about well, I if I looked on a woman that that meant I sinned, right? And, and that you know, and and he took it he took it really literally, and they they punked him out. I mean, they really did. They were they were happy to take Ronald Reagan, who had been divorced, and back then divorce was a big thing. It, it's not now, but for evangelicals back then it was a big thing. They were willing to take Ronald Reagan, who had been divorced, over Jimmy Carter. OK, because they thought he was weak. He wasn't manly enough. And so I think that, you know, he fits into the story as a as an evangelical who who turned away from what, you know, patriarchal white evangelicalism was all about and decided that I want to do some stuff for people. I'm reading the scripture. Let's do Habitat for Humanity. Let's do something that's, you know, go help. Let me be like Jesus. OK, let me be like the real Jesus. So, you know, somebody today said this. It, um, I can't remember who it was, but it basically said if Jesus died today, if it was Jesus, they'd probably say instead of being crucified, he was on fentanyl or something else like they're trying to say about George Floyd. So I look at Jimmy Carter as someone who is a, you know, understands scripture, understands what being a red letter Christian is. That means all the red letter things Jesus said and also was willing to leave his denomination because they were they were not doing right they were you know looking for being more conservative instead of trying to think about how they could help other people Listen, I, I so appreciate on this Good Friday that for you to even say it uh, as simply as um, you know let me go ahead and be like Jesus um, and it, it, <laughs> okay um, uh, in terms of just being able to say, um, you know, the story of Jesus is not really a triumphant one, right? If you look at just his human life, right? This is a person who mostly lives in poverty, who is um, rejected, who is who dies a violent death, um, and actually has very few friends, and one of those turns on him. So it yeah. is it's not actually a particular muscular mass version of um, uh, of the, the you know the male head God. Yeah. So. Let's talk a little bit then about, um, again, this idea of the Old and New Testaments, which is showing up here in a question by um, Gilberto, who is, who is asking about this kind of Old Testament sensibility within contemporary white um, evangelicals, um, and asking again about this question, not only about justice, which we talked about, but compassion. Um, uh, <laughs> to sacrifice, genuinely sacrifice the things that you have for power for others. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, for evangelicals nowadays, this, the Old Testament readings sort of say something about their orientation to a, a hardness, a, a way in which they, they are unforgiving towards certain people. So, you know, the ways in which the, you might see people say things about <clears throat> the border now, right? Or, or immigration, like, why do we need to take these people? Or let's just take these kids because their parents aren't taking care of them. Not thinking about what it means to be, you know, to, to have to try to bring your child here so that they could be safe or to send your child on this journey, right? I mean, I think these are the people who forget that, you know, part of this whole story of Jesus's life is that he's a refugee too, mm -hmm. because he has to leave his country so that he doesn't get killed, mm -hmm. right? And then he has to come back. And so that there's a refugee story in and of itself. But the thing, 
about evangelicals with the Old Testament, I think is about how do we keep other people in line? And so it's always about the law instead of grace. Grace is for them and not for you. And so when that happens, it becomes a very disturbing kind of thing because this is where we get all the law and order stuff, all this, we need to put them in jails, we need to put them in prisons, you know, and when we put them in prison, then we're going to do a prison ministry, and we're going to get them saved, and then they can just stay in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so let's so let's talk about uh, let's let's go to that a little bit around um because you you brought to, us to prisons and we began obviously um with the the issue of uh of the trial of, of Derek Chauvin talk to me about where the police policing and law and order stand in this overall white evangelical worldview and I'm um this is actually partly Kevin Webb's question uh he actually didn't ask a question about the book per se he was like what the hell with the policemen who were standing around while yeah. being murdered by by Derek Chauvin I recognize that that's actually a murder trial but I'm not an actual journalist at the moment so I'm going to say what I saw looking at the film um but but talk to me about wh how white evangelicalism fits into a kind of bystander position, not only for those officers, but for so many white folks um, who are complicit in the suffering and death of black people. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what happened with George Floyd and the, the outpouring that happened with George Floyd happened because everybody was home and they saw it, right? I think if we had been in a normal time and it had been no pandemic, nothing would have, it would have been the same thing. Black people would have been out in the streets, no, you know, a few white people would have been out in the streets who were down and everybody else, and that would have been it. Now, this particular time, everybody saw it. But here's the thing. This is how this gets preached, all right? So sometimes it's like, well, he didn't do what the cops told him to do. He, they, he didn't follow orders. If he had only followed orders, then this would be right. This is what Franklin Graham said about, you know, basically Mike Brown and, and lots of other different people, right? This is the thing they said, if you just will comply, because their idea about the law is that you are subject to it. They may not be subject to it but you are subject to it. And, and that, but that's already baked into the story because the story is, is that you are unruly. You are not the person who is, you know, you don't have civilization. That's the whole reason why they bring Christianity places in the 19th century is because it's about civilization. How do we make you civilized, okay? Mm -hmm. And so this, this talk that you hear all the time when people were out protesting, these are just thugs, these are just thieves, this is all this other stuff where everybody gets tainted with the same brush, right? Mm -hmm. This is coming out of a sense in which they are judging everybody Mm -hmm. because they already don't think that you are capable of taking care of yourself or reasoning. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hate to say it like that, but it's the truth. So, so I want to, I want to then build on that with Troy's question, who's asking about whether or not you think there's any hope of evangelicals changing, right? Um, given sort of the, the long story, the long history that you've written in this text, um, given the intensity of what we're seeing right now, do you think there's a possibility of change? I, I think maybe for younger evangelicals, yes. I'm not sure about the older ones because it's really difficult for them to see past everything. And so I don't know if they can because, you know, I, I wrote a book in part because I wanted people to sort of see this history. It wasn't just about evangelicals. It was about everybody else who had to deal with them. But I do think there's a sense in which demographics is going to get them because the demographics are not working for them right now and they're losing they're losing people everybody's churches are getting smaller you know people will say to themselves you know i'm spiritual but i'm not religious and i think a younger generation i think the only thing that they really do care about right now is abortion they they want to be pro life but the rest of it they don't care if gay people get married they don't care about homosexuality they don't care about that they don't have those same kinds of things and i think you know, this is where I'll bring the political into it. What Donald Trump did was basically show you who evangelicals really are. Mm -hmm. And that was probably part of the beauty of what he did because it just took the covers off of everything. Evangelicals have been able to hide behind their moral issues for a long time. And now there's no hiding. They are for, they are for people who are really not good. And <laughs> they will support those people who are really bad people. And they can't pretend anymore that they're really good people. And this is, the, 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 the con is up. It was a short con with Trump, but it's a long con everywhere else. And that's the, that's the whole point. 
So to me, this is interesting. It goes to a question that Sophia asked, which is, is Christianity even a coherent system of beliefs, right? So, you know, when we look at, um, when we look at, at sort of what you're pointing out here around, like, how can you claim to be for these things and then be for Trump who, like, beyond racism, like, let's just put racism aside, not that we should, but let's just put that aside mm -hmm. and look at all of the other presumably um, critical you know, foundational moral issues, Trump simply does not, right, reflect those. Yeah. Is there coherence, either ideologically or theologically in this? Uh, there's coherence insofar as they have decided about what they want to be coherent about. Mm -hmm. And so when I say that, what I'm saying is, is that they have a certain way to think about their scriptures, they have a certain way to think about things. And what's holding some of the coherence together right now for evangelicals quite frankly, is conspiracy theories. And we can talk about that in terms of something very simple, whether you're going to get a vaccine or not, okay? So for a lot of these churches, when, when people started saying that they weren't going to wear masks, what was it about? It was my religious freedom, okay? My religious freedom says I'm not supposed to wear masks. My religious freedom says I can come together and meet in the congregation. Well, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like the coronavirus don't care about your religious freedom. Coronavirus is going to get on you no matter what. And a lot of these pastors I've been tracking have died that have been talking about this was my religious freedom and everything else. And then they got the virus. Now, the same thing is happening with people who don't want to get the vaccine. They think it's not of God. They think it's going to be a chip in them or something like that. It's a conspiracy theory all over again. That has nothing to do with scripture. Nothing. But this is what people oh, wait. believe. But wait, doesn't it? I mean, because if I believe this is true, then here are yeah. some of the things I believe. I believe mm -hmm. that Origin had a baby. Yeah. I believe that um, a man died and a couple days later he got up and walked around and had mm -hmm. conversations friends. Uh, you know, I believe that that same person continues to engage in conversations with me today, thousands of years late. Like, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem that hard to go from the specific system of somewhat surprising beliefs mm -hmm. about what we think happened historically in the world and take them on faith claims and then go to like, oh yeah, I'm not wearing a mask. Yeah. I, Part of my question here is how do we reconcile that at its core, Christianity, and I, and I want to be really clear, I don't mean this as a critique, I mean it as, as, as literally descriptive, it requires us believing things for which there simply is no reasonable evidence in our lived experience. That is true. That is true. There is no reasonable evidence. However, there's reasonable evidence about wearing a mask. There's reasonable evidence about a vaccine. And, and so, you know, and there's even, I mean, and, and, and if you want to, you know, go as far as the Bible stuff, you know, there's, I, I'm not even going to say this because it's going to drive people crazy here, but you know, there's a place where they say the sepulcher is in Jerusalem, but that's probably not it. Okay. So I don't want to hurt y'all's feelings tonight, but you know, you gotta, you, you gotta really start to think about what it is and you can believe in Jesus, but you can get a vaccine because, you know, we can bring these two things together. You can bring together religion and science. They are telling you, you can't, you know? And that's the problem because a lot of people are going to die because they don't do what they need to do here. And we're in a nation where you can get a shot. But if you're in Brazil right now, you can't even get a shot. And that's horrible. And the, I actually, I actually want to wrap there because for me, that is, you make so many important contributions to public life, but what you just said for me um, is so foundational that I want to, I want to bring us to a close there, which is simply, um, that you are simultaneously a scholar with all of the suspicion that being a scholar requires, with all of the, the evidence gathering that being a, a scholar requires, with all the, the, the tracking and primary sources that being a historian requires, and you're a person of faith who makes and understands and embraces claims that are not based in those. And it is in fact about, as you said, not having to leave your brain at the door, yeah. about feeding spirit and community and mind. Um, and, and for me, that is so foundational, not only to this question of racism um, within the white evangelical church, but the question of like being full human beings, right, in our democracy and in our churches. And I just, I so appreciate that about your work and about your person. Well, thank you so much. And, and thanks for this great conversation. I really enjoyed it, Melissa, I really have. I did, I, I did as well, I miss you. Yeah, I miss you too. We'll do it again. Yes, we will. <laughs>
hopefully you two will get to do it very soon in person safely. Um, thank you both for this deeply insightful, critical conversation and extremely timely. Congratulations on the book. The book is available for purchase. Please do purchase the book. It's available via SOM Books, a local Black book vendor here in Los Angeles who we love to work yes. with. Please do check Bye out. from SOM. There you go. Please do check out SOM in person or uh, online. Um, also, please do be sure to check out the Amer American Experience on Billy Graham set to air next month via PBS. Check out your local listings for that. Um, and please do, of course, continue to follow Dr. Perry online. Keep up with her latest and greatest. Um, again, thank you both. And we look forward to seeing you all back at CAM very soon in person as the museums reopen. Check, out us, check us out online for tickets. Um, and everybody have a great night and great weekend. Great night. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter, Anthea. Bye. Bye. Take care.